In order to frame our conversation, we must initialize three states of time into being. The past, the present moment, and the future. But what does any of this have to do with liquidity pools? Let's go Zen. There is nothing but the present. It's always on the move through the sea of time. The waters look calm to us, but time is distorted and stretched by gravity between the vast amounts of mass clustering in the universe. But we forget this. We're always racing to the future to find the present. That light up ahead isn't the future. You'll never reach it, and you can't even see the past behind you. Ah, there you are. Look at everything move around you, but you're stationary. So what is the present? It's everything. From a philosophical point of view, liquidity mining is about two points in time, and only two points in time, where the future and the past coalesce into the present. One is when you add your liquidity to a pool. And the other is when you remove liquidity from that pool. These are the only two moments that matter, with a few exceptions. Most of the metrics you'll encounter are like trying to look at a speedometer to gauge how far you've traveled. You won't know how fast you were traveling in the past or how fast you'll travel in the future. It's just an indicator of now. A lot of what we'll be talking about comes from foreign exchange, also called Forex or FX. Forex is where we trade nation-issued currency pairs globally. In many ways, this is how cryptocurrencies get conflated with currencies, despite actually being utility tokens. It's because tokens, like currencies, are both liquid, meaning they can be moved around and utilized quickly, and fungible, meaning hot swappable. You don't care about the serial number on your US dollar, and you'll happily trade it for one with a different serial number. That's fungibility. We know that many parts of the crypto world operate like stocks. We watch crypto trade up and down. But other parts operate like Forex or currency trading, which is one of the riskiest markets on the planet. Crypto tokens, just like currencies, require a large available pool of paired assets to facilitate exchanges. With currencies, it's typically Tier 1 banks, the big international banks and state-run national banks that provide this liquidity and they lose money doing so. Let's hear that again. The Tier 1 banks often lose money by running and funding liquidity pools. In the blockchain world, the equivalent to Tier 1 banks offering liquidity pools is a centralized exchange. Coinbase, Binance, KuCoin, and others choose to list a coin. This means they hold large amounts of it in reserve, pair it with dominantly traded tokens like Bitcoin or Ether in a liquidity pool, and charge a small portion of the transaction as a fee. This is spot trading. Alternatively, you may be able to buy your desired token directly from the exchange for cash at or near spot price, but the fee may be higher. These fees are necessary to avoid financial loss by the exchanges. What the Tier 1 banks do for Forex, and the centralized exchanges do for crypto, is called market making. They provide a place to both buy and sell an asset, they are therefore market makers. A decentralized exchange, or DEX, aims to decentralize or remove the centralization factor of banks and exchanges from the crypto markets. In doing so, software called an Automated Market Maker, or AMM, is run that allows for the buying and selling of tokens. But where do they get their money to buy assets? Or where do they get the assets to sell? From you, voluntarily. They allow you to enter liquidity pools by contributing a crypto token and an equal amount of a second token as measured in fiat, and then enter the pool with them. These two tokens are called a trading pair. Since liquidity provision can lose money, the DEX applies a liquidity fee on top of each transaction, 0.3% on many exchanges, and they split all proceeds across each member in the liquidity pool divided by the appropriate share of the pool that they hold. But don't worry, this doesn't make decentralized exchanges necessarily more expensive because a DEX can get by on lower fees for itself. They often call these the developer or protocol fees. But what you've tasked yourself with answering is the question, how do I make money by providing assets into a liquidity pool? Within stable markets, providing liquidity earns you a share of the fee collected by the decentralized exchange. But during volatile market periods, 
it may not be possible for the fee to make up for losses in a number of ways. So what are the ideal market conditions for a liquidity provider? Basically, a bullish market where assets are appreciating. What types of markets are potentially bad for liquidity mining? Anything down tends to be bad for earning by providing liquidity. Bear markets, despite being great for asset accumulation, are especially bad for provisioning liquidity. Heavy volatility is also bad. If one of the assets in the pool or both are volatile, this makes the exchange volatile and the pricing swings aren't so friendly. But even in bear markets and during volatility, the liquidity pool must still exist to facilitate token exchanges. The tier 1 banks make up losses from their position as market maker by knowing prices early, seeing trends, and having immediate access to the market. Centralized exchanges can absorb almost all losses with their fee structure and by choosing which assets they do and do not want to list. Decentralized exchanges, however, have often turned to issuing secondary tokens as a way to make liquidity provisioning more enticing. Provide liquidity and not only split the fees, but also receive a secondary cryptocurrency or token. This generates a yield and therefore can increase your return. Once the market matures and the yield token has been distributed, decentralized exchanges will often turn to issuing derivative tokens that represent your share in the liquidity pool itself. But you're probably thinking, wait a second, I'm sending assets over to a liquidity pool and earning fees on my share of the pool, how exactly can I lose anything? When people are buying and selling tokens, exchanging one for another, remember where those tokens are coming from. They're yours. So let's assume a perfectly stable one-to-one -one relationship between two tokens, circle and triangle. More accurately, we have a 10 to 10 ratio as liquidity pools often require minimum amounts to enter. If somebody comes along and wants to let go of some circle by selling it to the DEX in order to have more triangle, the DEX puts that money into the pool because the pool is what actually provides the tokens. You now have more circle, but the exchange user expects something in return, triangle, so you're left with less triangle. Now the pool, hence fluid dynamics being our source of terms, leans one way and has a deep end and a shallow end because fluids level themselves. But what happens when we introduce a price change or variability in the exchange rate? Don't let that confuse you as they're essentially the same thing in a pool, as nothing else exists beyond two tokens in some particular balance, circle relative to triangle. If you're getting vibes of Einstein's relativity, that's because you should be, but I digress. How does the automated market maker set prices? It doesn't, at least not directly. It doesn't care about US dollars, euro, British pounds, or Singapore dollars. It cares about balance in the pool. And the AMM uses this balance to set quote unquote price, which is actually the ratio of how much of one token, circle, is needed by an end user to trade for another, triangle, or vice versa. It does this using the constant product market maker equation, which is shown here, but beyond our scope for this particular video. The important part is that this constant product market maker, or CPMM, uses a constant, K, which is created by multiplication, hence being named a constant product. In other words, some number you always get when multiplying the two things in the pool by one another. When the CPMM is plotted as a function, you get a hyperbola. This one represents all integers 1 through 20, with an initial constant set at 10 of each token, which was visualized earlier. And in this case, we've gone off of our 1 to 1 or 10 to 10 ratio and now have an 11 to 9. Again, skipping some of the math, this hyperbolic function now means that the exchange ratio between the two tokens is now altered. It's no longer 10 to 10. Again, I'm digressing to actual units for simplicity. It's now... 11 to 9.09. .09. In other words, the next trader must give slightly more circle to get slightly less triangle. But that's super weird to think about, so let's just be human about all of this and say that based on the math, the next person offering one circle token will only get about 0 0.83 triangle, rounding to the 1 100th position, that is. This seems like a big change in value, right? It is. 
And now you know why exchanges want so many more times total value locked or TVL in the pool than the largest conceivable trade could ever be. Simple. But if we fast forward past a bunch of other stuff you'll want to know about, and I'll explain in other videos, like how the collection of fees increase the constant, and how these ratios then impact fiat price, we'll then arrive at a place where you probably stare blankly back at the screen, slightly annoyed at all the math I've just sprung at you, and ask, but what is impermanent loss that I keep hearing about? Is it this? Well, sort of. Let's clear all the math away. While it is possible for a token, like circle or triangle, to only exist on one dex, that's not the default. Normally, a token is available on various dexes, centralized exchanges, and maybe even other places, like how Bitcoin is available in nearly every stock trading app you could possibly imagine these days. But the dex doesn't know anything about price. Sure, the front-end code for the DEX uses an API to grab the price and report everything back to you in US dollars, but frankly, that's been confusing you, hasn't it? I had to clear all of that away and invoke Einstein to even slightly help. And what was that help? Well, a ratio exists between one token and another. And here's all these pretty tokens sitting at balance in a pool. Except, we're not at balance, are we? Because we had a trade. Nor are other exchanges at balance, and this creates arbitrage opportunities. Our DEX just had a trade which altered the exchange rate along the hyperbola. But what happens when the buy and sell ratio and pressures create a price change in the larger market? Again, I'm skipping a few mathematical explanations and rounding, but it might be possible for the scenario you see in which the price of circle would rise, but our DEX doesn't know that because it doesn't incorporate external market prices and it has no idea what's happening on other exchanges. This creates an opportunity for someone to come to our DEX and buy our circle at an undervalued price relative to the market. They then take it and sell it elsewhere. This is arbitrage. But did you catch that? Your DEX is sometimes selling your tokens undervalued because A, it doesn't know better, and B, not knowing better and traveling the hyperbola is exactly how adjusting the ratio is supposed to work. This creates impermanent loss. You're taking a loss on tokens by selling them for less than they're worth. In other words, you'd have been better off keeping those tokens out of the pool and in your wallet in some cases. In which cases? In any case where the DEX is selling your tokens so undervalued that the receipt of the other token in the trading pair isn't sufficient to compensate you for the lost opportunity cost. Situations like a massive run-up of one token's value relative to the other can cause this, among other things. This is impermanent loss. It's called that because you only realize the loss if you exit the pool at that time while you have the loss. Remember, there are only two points in time that matter. When in one present moment you enter the pool, and in a subsequent present moment when you exit. There's a drive to relabel impermanent loss as divergence loss to better explain it. It's the loss you experience on one asset in the pool as market factors drive you in one direction or another along the hyperbola. I support this cause as the word impermanent makes one believe that a reverse trend is likely to come along and restore the loss and quantity of one token when that's not the reality in many pools. There is some calculable number here on screen based on this scenario of triangle tokens or even other tokens from other pools that an arbitrageur would like to spend buying our underpriced circle. But don't be fooled. The circle triangle pools aren't trying to be in equilibrium at 1 to 1 or 10 to 10 like we started. The pools are comfortable trading anywhere along the hyperbola because that's maintaining the constant and that's what's important. What then ultimately sets the price is the market as these tokens are traded against other assets including stablecoins and fiat, both on our decks and elsewhere. 